Welcome, welcome everyone. We're gonna go ahead and um, get started. Uh, my name is Kat Hill. I am the Volunteer Programs Coordinator with the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. And I am super enthusiastic about herps. These are also known as reptiles and amphibians. And I just wanna say tiger salamanders are my favorite animals. Um, before we get uh, too much into the details, I'd like to let you all know that we have uh, closed captioning enabled. And uh, while we do not have a chat, we do have Q&A um, available. So if you do have questions um, throughout the presentation, please do add them um, in the Q&A so that uh, Michelle, my lovely uh, co-host, um, can grab them at the end to share. I might not know the answers to all of your questions, but I will do my best to get you the best resources so that we can find out and learn more together. Um, this presentation is also going to be recorded and posted on our YouTube page. So let's get started. Let's learn about the smiling salamanders. And to introduce you also to the Open Space Authority. Um, the Open Space Authority is an independent district, a local government agency in the South San Francisco Bay Area. And our mission is to conserve the natural environment, uh, support agriculture, and connect people to nature by protecting open spaces, natural areas, and working farms and ranches for future generations. Furthermore, it is really important to acknowledge that the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority carries out its mission to protect, restore, and connect people to the land in the Santa Clara Valley and surrounding uh, Santa Cruz and Diablo Ranges. And these lands are the ancestral and unceded territories of the Eswaswas, Chochenyo, Mutsun, Tamayan, and Yilkut speaking peoples. As a public agency, it is our responsibility to acknowledge um, the historically documented violence and injustice that, is a, that occurred as local tribes were forcibly displaced from these lands. We also acknowledge and respect indigenous peoples of this place, including the Amamutsun tribal band and the Muwekma Ohlone tribes of the San Francisco Bay Area who work today to restore and protect their culture and connect to the land. So to get started, um, who is the California tiger salamander? Um, again, this is one of my favorite animals. Um, I'm not exactly a herpetologist, um, but I am an enthusiast um, for anything reptilian or amphibian, uh, cold-blooded. Uh, I think these are amazing creatures. And the tiger, uh, California tiger salamander holds a special place in my heart because it's one of those animals that I've actually not met in person yet. Um, it's like Loch Ness or Bigfoot in a way. It has its own mystery because it's an animal that is very rarely seen. Um, it's also a very vulnerable and sensitive species. Um, that is only found in California's grasslands. So the scientific name is Ambistoma California, californiensis. And this means that the tiger salamander belongs um, to the mole salamander group. Um, these um, tiger salamanders um, belong to that group which also includes um, other salamanders like the oxalotl. Uh, that is also a member of that group. Um, they're all characterized by larger, stouter bodies, protruding eyes, as you can see in this picture, and really colorful uh, body patterns. Tiger salamanders are the only salamanders that primarily live in grasslands. And the, I want to say also that the California tiger salamander specifically, it is a separate species than uh, tiger salamanders that you might find in the eastern United States 
Um, those include, it's actually estimated that the separation in population is like three to five million years, like they've been separated for that long. Um, so this, our species of tiger salamander in California is a very distinct and unique, genetically unique um, population um, of tiger salamanders in general. So we're really special. We get our own special kind of tiger salamander. And they're also really awesome because um, they're one of the only ones that live in grasslands. So where do they live um, specifically in California? Um, there are six distinct species or not species, um, populations in California. Um, they include two populations that are in Santa Barbara County and Sonoma County. Uh, both of those are very small and um, very separate than the rest of the populations. As you can see in this map, um, San Francisco, above San Francisco and Sonoma County, there's a little dot up there. There's also a smaller population down here near Santa Barbara. And both of those populations are, are uh, federally endangered. They're, they're listed under the Endangered Species Act. Um, the rest of the populations are found in the Southern San Joaquin Valley, in the Bay Area, and the Central Coast Range, as well as the um, Central Valley. And all of those populations are listed as federally threatened. So um, these are salamanders, like these are animals that uh, have special protections under the law. So when any new development is taking place and potential habitat for tiger salamanders, um, those um, populations and that development needs to be assessed under uh, CEQA, the California Endangered Species Act, for example. So, but to really understand, I think, like why they're endangered and, you know, why these populations are so separate, like it's also really important to understand a little bit about their biology and their life cycle. So their life cycle, um, they are an amphibian. Um, so amphibians have a specific kind of life cycle. They Amphibian literally means um, living part of your life in the water. Um, so there, the life actually starts out with an adult female tiger salamander. Um, females actually don't become sexually mature until they are about four years old. Um, but by that point, this female tiger salamander, she will wait until the winter rains of her fourth year. She's just gonna smell that petrichor and feel the dampness of the rains. And she's gonna decide, okay, I can leave my burrow. And she's gonna leave her burrow in search of a nearby pond. Um, she may travel up to a mile and a half in order to reach a, a pond. And by then, there will also be male salamanders. And of course, they will get down to business and you know, do their thing. But afterwards, the females are actually going to stick around in the ponds, and they can lay hundreds of eggs. Um, these eggs are a little different looking than a lot of other amphibian eggs. They don't um, exactly like goop together into a big mass. They kind of lay them in separate like jelly kind of, I guess, grapes, if you want to describe the, how they look. Um, that's actually a picture of some in the upper um, left-hand corner. So <clears throat> their eggs are slightly separate and they're gonna lay them on some vegetation in the pond. And those eggs with good condition, under good conditions, um, they're going to hatch in about 10 to 14 days. So about 10 to 14 days later, out comes these little larvae, like the one um, in the upper middle. These little cute larvae, which kind of look like fish, and they're 
like kind of greenish blue, sometimes um, brown. And they're also gonna have these lovely like gills, these like stringy gills that hang off of the side. Um, and during that time, they are gonna try to eat everything. They are voracious eaters. Um, they are gonna try to eat anything that will fit into their mouths and in the hopes of like getting big enough to outcompete um, any predators that might be in that pond. Um, so they're gonna eat and eat and eat. And over the span of about four to six months, um, they're gonna get big enough to where they're gonna start growing limbs, like the one on the upper or on the, on the right-hand side. And then they're gonna start to um, develop lungs and um, find a home, a new burrow, once their pond dries up. So those, um, once they have reached that stage, they are called a metamorph. And a good picture of one is actually down in the lower left. And they'll start to be like an, a limey uh, olive green color. They'll have fully developed their limbs. Um, they're starting to get some of their spots going. Um, and then they're gonna basically go find a burrow to inhabit for a little bit. I'm not entirely sure when they reach the final stage, but I wanna say it's like within the year, they actually get their characteristic black and yellow coloring, um, their yellow spots and um, that nice uh, yellow smile along their face. So that is the life cycle. It takes about a few months, um, basically from November until May, all the way into August sometimes, depending on how quickly the ponds dry up, um, for them to develop from a larvae or from a, an egg really all the way into um, a first year adult. Again, it takes about three to four years for them to become sexually mature um, so they'll have a few years of hanging out in the burrow before um, they're going to be ready to actually um, go find a pond of their own to go mate. I think what is super fascinating, though, is the fact that um, California uh, tiger salamanders rely so much on, um, they rely so much on burrows, um, small mammal burrows um, during the dry season. And these, these little guys, uh, the California tiger salamanders, they're not known as being great burrowers. Um, they um, instead take up residence in other animals' burrows. So, this is a great picture of like a California um, a ground squirrel burrow network. So a California tiger salamander may find the entrance to a burrow like this and go hunker down for months out of the year in order to escape the dry summer heat that we are well known for in California. This is super fascinating because it makes them um, a member of a like this kaleidoscope of a community, not just in the water, but also on the land. Um, it's important to also note that the tiger salamanders, they can move up to one and a half miles away to breed in a pond or to even find a new burrow to, to nestle down in. Um, it's not very common that they are seen during the day um, they actually like to go out under the cover of a dark rainy night um, in order to avoid predators and also to stay damp. Our own field technicians actually um, have found tiger salamanders in some really interesting places. 
There was a story that one of the um, technicians told me about finding a tiger salamander on the side of the road at Sierra Vista in like a tossed uh, salad container. The container had filled up with water and the tiger salamander had crawled in and he found them while he was opening in the morning. He was like, what are you doing? You know, and moved him off to the side, found a, you know, an entrance to a burrow for him to go in, but super fascinating. And they've also been found in places like um, under boards, irrigation boxes, that kind of thing. So they're, they're going to try to find cover um, if it's getting light uh, because they don't really want to be out when other predators are about. So what do they do while they're in their burrows or rather in other animals' burrows? Um, many scientists have believed that um, tiger salamanders estivate. So estivate, estivation, that is basically a period of torpor um, or slowed metabolism for certain amphibians and other organisms. Is ha especially happens in places where it is very hot and dry, like these animals will kind of go into a kind of a coma state where they are going to reserve their energy and kind of um, reserve whatever effort they, they can and, and all of that. So they don't need to eat or drink as much. They don't need to use up as many resources. Um, however, there really hasn't been too much evidence that California tiger salamanders actually estivate. Um, some scientists have tried to test this hypothesis, eh, this hypothesis out by putting a field camera on a stick down a burrow. Um, and they actually witnessed uh, tiger salamanders moving about in the burrow, actively foraging, moving you know around and all of that. Um, there's also been um, kind of anecdotal reports from people who have seen salamanders posted at the entrance to burrows at night um, during the dry season. So we don't think that they actually estivate. We don't think that they kind of hunker down and kind of go to sleep. They actually move around. They seem to hang out with a bunch of other organisms and how they interact is kind of a Kind of a mystery. Um, but as you can see, they have lots of different roommates that they share quarters with. In the uh, upper left hand corner, we have a pocket gopher. Lower left hand co corner, you got a burrowing owl. Middle, a badger. And then off to the right hand side, there's this wonderful picture of some California tiger salamanders cuddling up with some baby ground squirrels. So they will, they seem to tolerate um, living with other organisms fairly well. Um, also important to note that um, California tiger salamanders, they historically lived in, you know, vast grasslands um, that had tons of like wetlands, low wetland areas, and vernal pools. Um, uh, vernal pools, if you don't know, those are like seasonal depressions that fill up with water in the, in the winter time that, also, that then dry up during the summer. Um, these seasonal wetlands, like the vernal pools and the playa lakes, um, they provide tons of food. Like think tadpole shrimp, insect larvae, zooplankton, as well as the larvae of other amphibians. Um, and because CTS larvae, like the tiger salamander larvae are just so voracious, they'll eat anything that they can put in their mouths. Like they'll, their, their goal is to get as big as they can, as quickly as they can, so that um, they can survive to adulthood they can metamorphose. Um, 
Vernal pools and the seasonal wetlands are especially important um, because these also limit the types of predators that can prey on tiger salamander larvae, also limits the types of predators that can compete for food. So that's a reason why they have a preference for those um, like seasonal ponds and seasonal wetlands. I just love this picture, by the way. This is from Bay Nature. Um, has a little tiger salamander in one of the burrows. But of course, like everything else, they have their role on the food chain as well. Um, the California tiger salamander is food for lots of different other organisms, including lots of different birds like avocets and herons and terns, um, as well as for raptors. I think another report uh, from a field technician found a dead tiger salamander that had very obviously been dropped um, by a bird of some kind, probably a raptor. So we know that they are predated upon. Um, the larvae are also eaten by garter snakes. This is a picture actually from uh, the California Herps website of a garter snake eating a metamorph. Um, Adult newts may go after uh, tadpoles or, or rather larvae, uh, bullfrogs, crayfish, giant water bugs will eat them. Um, and obviously fish will also um, eat the larvae of California tiger salamanders. So they have a really um, important niche in, within the ecosystem. First off, as an amphibian, they're an important indicator of a healthy watershed. Um, tiger salamanders are sensitive to chemicals, to runoff and uh, things in the system. So the fact that you have tiger salamanders within a wetland or within a pond says that that water quality is, is pretty good, at least good enough for those amphibians. There are also pest control for mosquito larvae. Um, it, it has been said, I think, among some scientists that like the California tiger salamander larvae especially love to eat mosquito larvae. Once they get big enough, they're gonna go after that super hard. And then um, they're also food for predators higher up in the food chain. It's also really important to note that because of the protected status of California tiger salamanders, it means that the other organisms within those vernal pool habitats, um, within those open space habitats, also receive a certain amount of protection because that habitat as a whole needs to be um, conserved for tiger salamanders. So <clears throat> both legally and um, through, within an ecosystem, tiger salamanders play a really important role in our grasslands. It's also, um, as I mentioned, there are actually um, a lot of threats to California tiger salamanders. Um, there's not very many vernal pools left within the Bay Area or throughout California. Um, about 90% of vernal pools have been developed to some extent. Grasslands within a Central Valley have been developed. Um, so <clears throat> there isn't a whole lot of habitat left for California tiger salamanders. They need both the vernal pools, like the stock ponds, the um, the breeding habitat, as well as um, the upland kind of like um, grassland habitat where they would go and, and burrow. So that is the, the biggest thing. Um, the second thing, which has been a more recent, um, recently defined threat, I think, um, is uh, the introduction of the um, barred tiger salamander. The barred tiger salamander is 
um, an organ, it's an animal that has been, um, his, it was native actually to the Southeast um, United States. And um, it was introduced in California in the 1930s um, as a use of, um, as a form of fishing bait. The, the larvae are really good to use to, um, to fish. And unfortunately, these, um, these tiger salamanders are able to interbreed with our native um, tiger salamanders. Um, first off, like the very fact that you have a competing tiger salamander that uses a lot of the same habitat, uses a lot of the same food, means that you, you've created competition with our native salamanders. Um, <clears throat> The fact that you also have, they're, they're able to hybridize means that you have a threat to the very unique genetics um, of the California tiger salamander. So if you want to protect those unique California tiger salamander populations, um, <clears throat> it's, it's a really tricky situation um, because now you have hybridization going on, especially in the Salinas Valley. Um, and the last thing that is really considered a threat um, for California tiger salamanders are invasive species. Um, invasive species such as mosquito fish or like um, American bullfrog, um, tadpoles, those also provide competition for um, CTS larvae or California tiger salamander larvae, which are trying to grow and get big. Um, it also makes it, um, they also actually predate upon uh, the larvae of California tiger salamanders. So it's so um, important that we are able to control invasive species populations, um, provide more habitat, protect habitat where it exists, um, and try to prevent the spread of, um, you know, non-native uh, tiger salamander species, so we don't have our native species competing with and interbreeding with um, these different populations. So just some of the couple things um, that the authority does uh, for to manage tiger salamander habitat. Um, first off, we're an agency that works to protect open space. So anywhere where land has not been um, developed um, that is critical to wildlife connectivity, to wildlife habitat, um, we are especially concerned about for a, a long-term protection. Um, there's a couple of um, open space preserves that have been protected because of their value for wildlife, um, of the fact that they are rare, considered rare habitats. Um, grasslands in particular are considered a rare habitat. So uh, the authority really works to protect those rare habitats to provide wildlife connectivity where possible. Um, and so we worked really hard with our partner agencies to do that um, and been very successful in it. The other thing that we do is we also manage our lands to protect um, to help enhance and protect the uh, tiger salamander habitat. So that includes both the upland habitat as well as the, um, the breeding ponds. We actually, on open space authority lands um, and all the lands that we have protected, we currently do not have any lands that have vernal pools. Vernal pools are very, very rare nowadays, especially in the Bay Area. But we do have stock ponds. And stock ponds have become a very important source of like breeding habitat for tiger salamanders. Um, there are lots of stock ponds, say in the Diablo Range and the Santa Cruz Range. These are old lots of like private ranches, for example, um, which have been maintained to help water um, cattle. 
And because the, we don't really have a whole lot of vernal pools, um, these stock ponds have taken the place of those um, pools in many respects. Um, and in many ways have, you know, have served California tiger salamanders fairly well. Um, for one thing, tiger salamanders don't really like having a whole lot of vegetation around their pools. That's another reason why permanent ponds um, are not preferred for tiger salamanders. Uh, the large amounts of vegetation actually uh, shades out a lot of the pond, which can, which means that the water actually stays fairly cool, which isn't conducive to their growth. Um, they also like the turbidity in the water as well. More turbidity means that they are harder to see, especially those little baby larvae that are kind of like grayish, greenish colored. It's very hard to see them in the water, very hard for predators to get at them, especially herons or birds. And so in actuality, ponds like you see on the, um, on the left-hand side here are perfectly um, suitable habitat for tiger salamanders. And um, when we lease land to ranchers to graze around um, our grasslands and such, um, they are timed in such a way to graze around ponds, to reduce vegetation, but to not be there long-term necessarily. Um, there's a system of like um, stock ponds as well as water tanks and troughs where cattle are moved to across the landscape. So their impact on any one part of the landscape is reduced. Um, so it's to help manage, but also to help protect um, this breeding habitat. It's also really important to recognize like the importance of the upland habitat. So having protected grasslands in particular means that you're providing habitat for um, small mammals, such as the California ground squirrel. And if you've ever been to any of our open space preserves, you see them just about everywhere. Sierra Vista, Coyote Valley, Coyote Ridge, those um, ground squirrels are like these charismatic little critters that uh, I have seen just about at everywhere. Um, and in that respect, providing those um, burrows uh, and, that, and that kind of habitat is important for the second half of the California tiger salamander life cycle. Um, I would also like to shout out the fact that we have amazing volunteers who have worked to restore um, certain ponds in our open space preserves by reducing invasive um, species around those ponds. And so that's just another way the authority works to um, reduce hazards for the California tiger salamander to manage for their habitat, as well as protecting the landscapes on which they depend. Um, so I kind of, wraps up my little presentation. I'm glad to have you all here. Um, I just wanna say like, it's super cool to know that our work protects such an interesting and fascinating critter. Um, they're so secretive. I personally have never seen one yet. I hope to see one one day. Um, I might have to like go out after dark or something in order to see one um in the middle of like a rainy night but um i just know that they're out there and that um our work helps to protect them so if you have questions please feel free to share i'm happy to try to answer them and to point out some resources for y'all to further your curiosity and knowledge Yay. thanks kat that was awesome we do have a, quite a few questions in our q a Woo. If you haven't put your questions in the Q&A, feel free to put them in there now. 
Um, and we'll start at the top and go down. So the first question we have up is, do squirrels and gophers eat the tiger salamanders in their burrows or do they truly just exist? I know you said that the tiger salamanders don't seem to mind that they have roommates, but do the other species mind that the tiger salamanders are in there? So in my, in my research, and um, there's actually a really good presentation online that I was able to find off of, um, I wanna say it's the Elkhorn Slough's website, um, California Tiger Salamander Biology and Conservation presentation by Pete Trenum and Chris Searcy. So they discussed some of the interactions, I think. Um, there was a team of scientists that put uh, cameras down burrows, trying to see what they actually do. Um, and overall, um, the small mammals do not seem to be bothered by the tiger salamanders. Like um, there was an instance, I think of like, maybe this wasn't a California tiger salamander. This may be a, a different tiger salamander, maybe back east, but the gopher literally just picked up the tiger salamander in his way and moved him and then <laughs> kept digging his burrow, like not, not perturbed. Um, tiger salamanders themselves, they're about six to eight inches long. They're a fairly large salamander. So they try to eat one I don't know I don't think I would try to eat something nearly the same size as me if I'm a California ground squirrel or pocket gopher maybe if I was like a badger hmm. maybe yeah but <clears throat> the 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 small mammals don't seem to be bothered by them the salamanders don't seem to be bothered by the small mammals um there have also been reports I think of tiger salamanders eating the babies of small small mammals like hmm. think mice maybe you know Whoa, interesting <clears throat> but i didn't i didn't find a whole <laughs> lot of like specifics for california tiger salamanders on that just tiger salamanders in general just remember like tiger salamanders are found throughout the united states we have our own specific population which is really cool um but yeah very cool uh, next question, how can the threat of interbreeding with introduced salamanders or invasive species be addressed? Are there any eradication programs happening? Is, is there anything happening to prevent the spread of that species? It's really tricky. Um, I want to do more research on that. Um, I'd say California Fish and Wildlife probably have some programs in place where they're assessing that and that specific threat. I know that um, Elkhorn Slough actually has a small exhibit on it. They have actually, um, I think they have a barred salamander and they're at their visitor center and they talk a bit about that. Um, but no, it's, it's kind of a difficult uh, subject because um, the, they're using the same habitat and whatever you do to try to eliminate or eradicate uh, barred salamanders is probably also gonna affect um, the California tiger salamander as well. Any kind of trapping, any kind of uh, catch, um, catching or anything like that. So yeah, that's a question that I actually wanna find more information about. That's a great one. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it seems like it would be a hard thing to mitigate against. Uh, do the private ranchers with stock ponds try to protect salamanders? I know since they're an endangered species, are there any like requirements they're supposed to follow? That is another good question. Um, from what I understand, it depends on the rancher. Most of the ranchers that we work with on our lands, um, it is a, a goal and a requirement to help protect local habitats while grazing on our landscapes. Um, so yes, for, for us, um, for sure. Um, for private ranch lands, I think it's a little bit different. Um, I am not fully, um, I'm not fully aware of the requirements that private landowners have 
um, for protecting um, endangered species under the California Endangered Species Act. Um, so that is another question that, yeah, I definitely would love to find more information out about. Um, it's not an area that I usually think about, but given the fact that tiger salamanders, um, on California tiger salamanders, a lot of their breeding habitat is on private ranches. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, that, that seems to be a critical question there. I like it. Definitely. Uh, next question, can uh, tiger salamanders use creeks or big reservoirs to breed or is it just for the, the stock ponds and the vernal pools? Um, there have been reports of them using streams, um, but there, it's very rare. And my hypothesis, so I don't, don't put too much stock in it, do some research, but I, my, my hypothesis is that they don't like fast moving water. Um, fast moving, cold water, not really ideal for the development of their larvae. Um, they like the slow moving or stagnant warm waters of vernal pools, stock ponds, um, even the big playa lakes. Like there's a really good example of this up in Jepson Prairie near Sacramento. There's like a huge playa lake um, that has been studied extensively because it has a good population of tiger salamanders. Um, in terms of large reservoirs, not really. So any kind of reservoir that has permanent fish in it um, is going to compete with the um, salamander larvae. Um, so anything that dries up seasonally is actually really good for them because it means that fish can't live there. Um, and so that's why they seem to like our stock ponds. They seem to like vernal pools a lot. They seem to evolve with the vernal pools. Um, but the, um, anything with permanent water that could potentially get fish um, means that they're going to be competing for food and not do as well. That's great. I like that question because it really highlights a specific habitat need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting because I know a lot of newts and salamanders do live in running water. So yeah, it's interesting that they have evolved so specifically to vernal pools. But it makes sense. It means there's less predation. Mm -hmm. And vernal pools are just amazing. Habitats. They are really cool. They're super cool. I wish we had more of that. <laughs> I wish we had some on our property so we could take people out for walks and, and look at things. Um, we're skipping a couple questions, but this one just popped up from a conversation. Do they breed in Laguna Seca at all? Um, Laguna Seca is a property that we have that's historically a wetland. Uh, and it ah. kind of sounds like this. It, it gets wet in the winter, dries completely in the spring. So it does sound like their habitat. Uh, it do does. You know? It does. And I mean, I have not seen anything mm. really that yeah, I haven't heard of anything says there, really. that they have bred there. There are other salamanders and um, organisms that will, but not the tiger salamander, unfortunately. Um, I don't know, maybe historically they have, but because of development, like Laguna Seca has also been highly modified. Yeah. Um, and even until like a few years ago, like um, regularly dissed and, and, you know, that kind of thing. So eh, it's, it's hard to say. Um, historically, probably now, definitely not. I don't think um, surveys have turned up tiger salamanders. Mm -hmm at Laguna Seca. Yeah. Do we want them back? Heck yeah. That would be so cool. <laughs> that would be so cool. Uh, so next question is, how did the invasive salamander get introduced? And when they crossbreed with the California tiger salamander, what are the crossbreed species? What are their, mm -hmm. you know, children like? They're, they look a lot more like the barred salamander when crossbred. Um, but yeah, so how they were introduced. So they were they were brought in in the 1930s because they were good fishing bait. Um, people started, you know, bringing them in from the southeast because they were fast growing and also fast reproducing, and um, brought them into our local ponds and streams. Um, 
to do that so that people could go out and they could gather fishing bait super quickly. Um, which, you know, in hindsight, not a great idea. Um, bringing in a one species kind of messes with the delicate balance of the ecosystem on, on our end. Um, but yeah, and, and all the pictures that I saw, which I highly recommend going to californiaherps.com and looking up the California tiger salamander page because they show pictures of the, the eggs, the larvae, the metamorphs, and then also the adult salamanders, the barred salamander, what that actually looks like, the hybrids, what do those look like? Um, they also have some really great pictures of, um, of predation, like the, the garter snake picture that I had earlier, eating the tadpole or the metamorph. And that was from there too. So um, definitely check that out if you wanna take a closer look at what the difference looks like. But to me, they look a lot more like the bar salamander than they do the, the CTS. Awesome. Now this is um, a question that a few people have right now. Um, mm -hmm. uh, if you see one, is it harmful to them to pick it up? Is it harmful to you in any way? Will they bite you? Poisonous? Well, yeah, they're not poisonous. They're not toxic. Um, however, if you were to pick up any kind of amphibian, um, the most important thing to remember is that um, we, we have certain things on our hands that can be really harmful to them. Um, specifically, like if you use lotions and things like that, also sweat. Um, salts from your hands, the, the warming and the dry effect of your hands. Um, remember, they're moist creatures. Some species of amphibians also breathe through their skin. So if you were to pick one up, like you need to use gloves, definitely. At the very least, like wet your hands or, you know, and do that. Um, for tiger salamanders specifically, you want to avoid handling them when at all possible, unless like they are in immediate threat of danger, like they're crossing a road or something. Like um, I know that it is um, California law that um, handling any kind of endangered species <laughs> requires a permit for the most part. Um, and you don't want to get in trouble by like going out and picking them up and stuff like that. If, for example, if we were to go and survey and go and monitor for CTS larvae, we would have to go to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to get a permit um, to, in order to do that. So, you know, use caution, use your best judgment, and don't pick them up unless you absolutely have to. So speaking of picking up tiger salamanders when you absolutely have to. One of our attendees has the wonderful privilege of having a couple of tiger salamanders living in their backyard, in their, um, under their recycling bin. And they are worried about, you know, if they try to garden or move the recycling bin, um, hurting the tiger salamander. So how can they you know, find a safe place for them in their yard and how should they approach the tiger salamander? I don't know. That is a, wow. That is so, that is amazing and also kind of like scary because yeah, I feel the same way. Mm -hmm. I feel like, I don't know what I'd want to, how to handle this animal. Yeah. Um, so I guess the best thing is to consider where you are in terms of like your local open space. Are you like on the urban interface between wildlands? Are you, I don't know if you're in the city, anything like that. Um, but also what I would recommend is um, contacting a local university or um, the Department of California, or Department of Fish and Wildlife, California. And to get, to get the best recommendations for that, um, they may be able to send somebody out to move that animal for you safely to a habitat that you know is better for them because I can imagine being under being under a recycling bin that can't be 
that can't be a fun time for that salamander. Um, but definitely, I know Stanford has definitely done a lot of research and they have a department that works with um, amphibians and, and salamanders. Our local UCs like Santa Cruz, um, Berkeley, both of those have departments. So it may be your best bet to like contact somebody who's an actual herpetologist who can actually help you. I cannot because I'm not a herpetologist. Um, but that's where that's definitely where I would where I would go is either that or the, the Department of Fish and Wildlife in California. Okay, a few more questions. Is, do you have a rough estimate of the tiger salamander population in the Bay Area? That is, is a good question. It is really difficult to get at. Um, it's really difficult to get at because first off, um, it's difficult to get, get an idea of like how much breeding habitat there is left. There isn't a whole lot. Um, but a lot of that breeding habitat is in areas that are very difficult to survey. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is um, the populations are going to be different in different places, depending on the availability of like prey and, and insects and things like that. Um, the other part of it too is like the adult tiger salamanders are very elusive. They um, you know, they hide out in burrows. How are you going to figure out like the burrowing network of, of, you know, ground squirrels and gophers and all the other organisms that make burrows and then, you know, estimating population from that. So I am sure that there have been a couple of studies, but I also imagine that getting at a specific number is very, very difficult. Um, there is a reason though that they have been listed as threatened and endangered. And that's because of the fact that a lot of their habitat, um, especially down in the valleys, um, have been paved over or um, turned into agriculture. So yeah, I can't, I can't give you a number. That's a really difficult, that's a really difficult question, even for scientists, I think. Next question is, is the toad that it competes with also invasive? Oh, the um, American bullfrog? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is an invasive. Um, the American bullfrog is usually more, it's native to the Eastern United States, um, not native here. So um, where introduced here, like it, it has a tendency to eat everything. Um, very voracious um, and hard to get rid of. So that's a good, that's a good question. Yeah, it's invasive. So invasive. Uh, mm -hmm. And then last question we have, are California tiger salamanders vulnerable to pesticides and agricultural chemicals? They are. Um, in fact, in the presentation, that uh, California tiger salamander presentation, um, it was mentioned like the reason why the hybrids are, um, are taking over, especially in the Salinas Valley, was because they do better in like agricultural sag ponds. Um, you know, so like runoff ponds and agricultural areas in Salinas Valley. Um, and the, the hybrids, the, you know, between the barred salamander and the California tiger salamander seem to do better in those sag ponds than do the native, you know, non-hybridized salamanders. So um, the native salamanders are very sensitive. The barred um, hybrids seem to have some kind of resistance to some of the pesticides and agricultural chemicals that come from runoff. Um, and, you know, that's definitely going to have a change in the population dynamics, especially in areas where that's a, you know, that's a pressure, that's an evolutionary pressure. So, you know, that's a good, 
That is a good question. And definitely um, there's, there's some research being done on it. Very cool. And then one of our attendees uh, wanted to point out that the American bullfrog is definitely invasive, but there's also um, an American toad that is not invasive. Yeah. They also said the bullfrog has tasty legs. Oh, mm -hmm. maybe that's what we should do is sponsor more restaurants and, mm -hmm. you know, cuisine that eats invasive species. And I think so too. Diversify our palates a little bit. I think it's good. <laughs> by that and, and provide more of a pressure to keep those populations in place yep yeah cool. but yeah i am i'm super stoked to have everyone here and to um share just some of the basics like i i don't i am not an expert but um i'm an enthusiast so if you do have any follow-up questions any other thoughts please feel free to email you know open space authority um and we can certainly share more resources and more thoughts with you. Um, glad to get to share this with all y'all. Yeah, and the recording of this program, or this program will be, is recorded. It's gonna get posted on our YouTube channel on the following week. Uh, and once it gets posted, we will send out the link to everyone who signed up. That way, if you guys wanna watch it again or share it with friends. Thanks. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Thanks awesome. everyone for coming. Thanks, yep. Kim. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Have a great holiday. Yeah. We'll see you the next time. See you next time. Bye. Bye.